Okay, first of all, doing your spell check. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, this is a, just a subcommittee in policing, and it's our thirteenth meeting of uh, two thousand and eighteen. We have apologies from Daniel Johnston. Agenda item one is Police Scotland's role in the migration process, um, and uh, I refer members to uh, paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a, a private paper. And I welcome uh, Graham O'Neill, Policy Officer of the Scottish Refugee Council. Uh, Chief Superintendent John McKenzie, um, Head of Safer Communities Specialist Crime Division, and Sergeant. I do beg your pardon, yes. Uh, no, we haven't done item one, which is taking uh, <laughs> discussions on our work programme in private. It helps if you don't strike out things in your note you have in front of you. Um, a, yeah, so are we agreed to take that business in private? Agreed. Yes, and thank you to the members for the very helpful <laughs> additional chairing. Yeah. So, um, yes, welcome Chief Superintendent John McKenzie and uh, Sergeant Graham Sterling, Prevention and Interventions, DG Division Police Scotland. And thank you for your um, written submissions, which are always very helpful to the subcommittee. I wish I could convey thanks to the Home Office for their written submission, but notwithstanding them having plenty of time to respond to us, uh, they've done us the discourtesy of not responding, which I, I think is, is very disappointing. Uh, I'll now move to, to questions on the issue, and what, what I'd be very keen to understand from the panel is, uh, and well, particularly Police Scotland, to comment on the current relationship between Police Scotland and the Home Office with regard to immigration removals and detentions. Um, for example, would it be possible to outline the particular roles and responsibilities for each organisation? Chief Superintendent. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I suppose the, um, I would probably like to start off by highlighting that the relationship uh, with regards to Police Scotland and the Immigration Service probably takes a number of different strands. And if I may, I would just like to touch on those if I could. Uh, and for my ease, um, when I'm talking about Home Office Immigration Enforcement, if I refer to Home Office Immigration, that is what the, the, the term I'm referencing. Um, I suppose there are six strands to our relationship and our, um, the parameters on which we work. Uh, the first um, strand is that of a relationship of information sharing, in which we share information between ourselves and Home Office uh, based on an information sharing agreement which was signed back in 2016, which is embedded in the previous Data Protection Act and uh, meets the criteria of the 2018 Act. And that information is in relation to ensuring that um, the activity in terms of um, excuse me, in terms of sharing information in relation to criminal activity or statute um, is met. The second component to this uh, relationship is that in which quite a lot of the interest lies. It's that activity in relation to the enforcement activity of Home Office immigration. Um, that relationship, in my view, is quite um, straightforward in as much as Home Office Immigration have primacy over that activity. Um, we have a protocol in which we will uh, share information. Uh, that um, takes the form of an operational notification form which is provided by the Home Office and there's three sections within that document that's required for police completion. That allows the Home Office Immigration to ultimately make a determination on the risk that is uh, in relation to the activity that they int intend to undertake. That might be activity that they refer to as an administrative removal or a removal in terms of um, deportation as a result of identification of somebody of high harm. Um, Chief Superintendent, could I interrupt you there? C could you just confirm if that's in respect of each individual or would that be in respect of a location, for instance? That would be in respect to each individual. So the form is individual based, but uh, you are correct in uh, if you're, there may be a number of individuals within a, 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 the same location. Uh, that form allows um, police to undertake a community impact assessment to determine what the impact on the wider community would be to allow us to then have a wider discussion with the Home Office Immigration to make decisions on the appropriateness of the action that's been undertaken, the impact on wider community, and then allow us to put in measures to minimise or mitigate the risk. Um, I want to be clear at that point. Um, the, that form 
is then uh, there is a follow-up process which allows Home Office Immigration to ask for police assistance as and when required based on risk. Um, I, the, <clears throat> the general view is that actually those numbers are quite minimal in terms of police interaction. However, from figures that I have received uh, from Greater Glasgow, since May of this year, there has been 68 operational notification forms from Home Office, of which 10 of those have resulted in police activity or police assistance. And let me be clear what that police assistance looks like. That police assistance is not activity in relation to the apprehension of individuals that the Home Office have identified. Police activity is purely to ensure that the process is undertaken peacefully uh, and that community reassurance is maintained. As soon as an arrest takes place, police will, uh, the, the two, normally two officers, will remove themselves from that area. But in 10 occasions of 60, 68, sorry, I do apologise, 68 from May, that, that's been police involvement. I wonder, before moving on, could I ask some questions about what you've said today there, Certainly Superintendent? So, so, so for, for instance, I, I think a community impact assessment is an excellent idea. Who's engaged in that process? Um, and it does suggest a, a long lead-in time, necessarily, rather than you know anything that's spontaneous. So who's involved in the risk assessment? Are, are the police involved in the risk assessment? Yes, of course they are. The, the police are involved and the officer to my left is a bit of an expert in community impact assessments. However, the police are involved, the Home Office are involved, wider partnerships would be involved if required. So depending on the circumstances, depending on the location, that uh, there would be a partnership discussion about the community impact um, and the best way to mitigate any risks that have been identified. However, let me be clear again, a community impact assessment may not be deemed to be required for every for every occasion. It will be dependent upon risk factors identified through the operational notification form, of which there are 12 sections, three of which we complete. And is it possible that you could share, for instance, the, a blank form? Or, yes, you, I may. Or, or, or even a sample of a community impact assessment suitably anonymised, would that might be helpful? Yes, I shall. I'll certainly be able to provide Thank that uh, for, the, for the committee. Thank you. I'll, um, if I move on then, the, the third component to this strand is joint initiatives. So the committee will have heard of Operation Mighty, which was in the press earlier on this year in relation to activity in Govan Hill, in which Police Scotland and Home Office have been involved in a joint initiative. However, again, let me be clear on this. There was a wider partnership involvement. HMRC were involved, other partners were involved. And again, that is activity to potentially identify criminality on this occasion. It was in, in relation to serious and organised criminality, but also to identify and support vulnerable members of the community uh, to provide support in case there's a, a, a actions of human trafficking or forced labour. We are there to try and support and identify those activities. Um, the fourth component to this, and I'm sure it will be raised uh, as we go on in the next hour, is the provision of custody facilities. Um, and again, HMICS referred to the custody facility in 2014. Um, and again, um, we have primacy when Home Office bring an individual to custody. Uh, it's Police Scotland's responsibility for the welfare of an individual in custody. Police Scotland have primacy and we will determine whether there is grounds for that person's uh, continued um, detention we will be responsible for ensuring the rights of that person is achieved, including the provision of legal support and um, informing a reasonably named person, as we would for anybody else. In, in relation to that aspect, then, uh, uh, Chief Super, um, can you say uh, what criteria you, would you would Police Scotland use to determine that the person is being lawfully detained? That would be, and again. Uh, Graham may wish to make comment later on. However, that will be de dependent upon the information that's been provided by the agency who has undertaken that arrest, in this occasion, Home Office Immigration Enforcement, as we would if it was military police or HMRC or any other law enforcement agency that used our facility. They would provide information, they would provide justification under the statute in which they were um, had undertaken that arrest, and the custody officer would ultimately make a determination was that uh, arrest lawful under the terms of that statute? Okay. And have there been instances where uh, uh, someone's been presented at a charge bar and the 
Police Scotland have said we don't consider this a, a, lo a lawful arrest. I anticipated that question may have arisen today. To my knowledge, no. Can I clearly say that that has been the case uh, over a number of years? I cannot, but to my knowledge and the information that I've received, that has not been the case. OK, thank you. Um, the, the fifth component, I suppose, is the relationship we do have embedded officers in Home Office Immigration Enforcement. We have two embedded officers um, as on secondment uh, in the criminal and finance investigation teams. Uh, and likewise, Home Office Immigration, uh, there are two officers based at GAT Kosh uh, to support Operation Nexus, which again is, I'm sure, will arise, but that's information sharing in relation to um, foreign national offenders. Um, and lastly, um, I suppose, um, and um, the, the last component of the relationship, I suppose, is that distinction between the activity we undertake at borders, uh, at ports through border force compared to Home Office immigration. I'll not touch on that because I understand the committee are not uh, investigating that component, but these are the six strands that I would suggest are the main areas of the relationship with ourselves and Home Office immigration. Okay, thank you very much. That's very comprehensive. I've just got two very um, brief questions before I, I move on to colleagues. One of them is, you talked about primacy, and that would clearly apply in the situation of determining whether it was a lawful arrest and the person was going to be retained in, in, in police custody. Does Police Scotland ever have primacy in any of the operations where it is enforcement simply on immigration issues? No. No, no. Okay. Thank you. And as regards the the, the data, is, would there be statistics um, regarding? I mean, I know you talked about 68, and 10 of them would be specific where there would be a different type of police involvement. Are there comprehensive statistics kept of this? You mentioned Greater Glasgow, but Scotland wide. Yes, I could get you data, and I'm more than happy to take that away. Um, I'm aware that there have been 88 requests within E Division since January. Um, however, I would have to go to each division because the process that's adopted is there are spots within each divisional intelligence unit and it is the divisional intelligence units which undertake the, the checks. I will provide those details. It may take me a period of time, but I will provide those details for um, for the committee. That would be very helpful. Now, there's, there's quite a number of questions we've got through, and I'm conscious I've taken up time. But So, uh, on the generality of what you've heard, would you wish to comment, um, Mr O'Neill, on that? There will be specific questions on other matters, sure. but on what you've heard, please. Uh, well, on, well, first of all, <laughs> uh, thank you to the committee to, to taking time on, on this, this issue. Uh, we think there's a significant public interest in, in shedding more light on the relationship between key devolved institutions, such as Police Scotland, as well as you all saw from our written evidence, Scottish Prison Service and the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, on the one hand, with the Home Office, particularly through its Immigration Enforcement, Border Patrol, eh, and Visas and Immigration eh, functions. On the other hand, eh, I think I really welcome eh, what what John eh, has said on behalf of Police Scotland. It's, it's, it's getting to precisely the kind of uh, clarity that you know we think is there is that public interest in. Uh, I don't know if, if if there's space for me to just kind of say a few points. You know that we do think relate to what to what John has said. Yes, of course. Uh, so I think I think the f the first thing we wanted to kind of say aside from the public interest and why we as a refugee rights agency were we're, we're raising this issue is is that we have been uh, working for a long time, you know, at the sharp end of uh, Home Office policies in relation to, to a very vulnerable population, asylum seekers, uh, particularly in Glasgow, but uh, to a lesser extent elsewhere in, in smaller parts of Scotland. And one of the things that we've picked up, you know, is it is is it that people have very low awareness of their rights, uh, often have mental health issues, and often they stem or are aggravated by that insecure immigration status that they have. Uh, and we're seeing, we're looking not too far in the future, and this is in no way a political point, it is more a statement, we think, of immigration fact, that you know, with it, if, the, if, if, if Britain and UK, once, if and when it does withdraw from the European Union, and that will create a higher risk for a higher number of people of insecure immigration status. There will be people that may not be able to satisfy 
the, the, the settled status scheme. Uh, and that being the case, and we can maybe talk about that a bit later on in terms of why specifically we have grave concerns there, as, as a refugee rights charity that have worked in the asylum system, we can see a lot of the risks of destitution and vulnerability and therefore the, 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 the involvement of home, the Home Office through its immigration enforcement activities being visited also on people who currently have secure immigration <coughs> status by dint of being in, in an EU member state and ne therefore in the UK, but they may not have that. Uh, so we think that there's a, there's, a, there's a higher risk of insecure immigration status affecting a higher number of people. Uh, and we think part of that wider context as well is that, you know, the that you know, people often experience the, and talk about the hostile environment uh, in relation to uh, persons with insecure immigration status. We see that for people that we are working with seeking refugee protection. <coughs> um, and that hostile environment has been within the asylum system for a very long period of time. Um, and one of the, some of the things that it comprises um, that are often not recognised is that there's been a real exponential growth in the number of actions within uh, immigration law which are defined as crimes um, and that is that's an area that you know that, that that police scotland will that will impact on police scotland's practice in our context as well as the crown office and procurator fiscal service in practice it will have that impact in, in the prison service and the second issue is we've seen a really rapid growth in the use of criminal sanction regimes uh, more particularly recently you know so for example the immigration act 2016 sets down a criminal sanctions regime in relation to landlords who uh, rent out properties that's not yet up to people who have not got secure immigration status uh, now that's not currently at effect in scotland it is in effect in england but it's a kind of example of the growth of criminal activities into immigration law um, and I suppose one of the other issues that, we're, we're, that we've really picked up in our, in our work is that we're, we're concerned about recent changes within data protection legislation which will remove rights of access through data protection legislation for individuals who are subject to immigration control uh, and they might not be able to use mechanisms like subject access requests to get information which might be quite important for them if they're trying to understand how statutory bodies are passing information about them uh, and very important to inform their work in terms of trying to intervene in relation to maybe prevent you know removal from 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 the country um, so we can I'm conscious of yeah, a, yeah. a number of questions, Mr. O'Neill, yeah. and, and if, if at the end you feel something we haven't covered, likewise, yeah. uh, Mr. McKenzie, Mr. Sterling, um, we can pick up on it. But we've, we've a number of questions, yeah. and if we don't pick up, hopefully we will get the opportunity. First one's from Fulton. Please. Yeah, thanks, Gavin. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, I'm just wondering if, um, if any of the panel are aware if any information is given to agencies working with migrant communities prior to removal. So those agencies that would be engaging and supporting the communities, are they are they given forewarning, if you like, or, or, or notice that, that a removal would be taking place? Um, <clears throat> um, I would anticipate no. Um, I would anticipate that what we have is, and again, I, I would suggest it's for Home Office Immigration to answer that question. Mm. Um, however, uh, from purely, a, if I was to take it from a purely policing perspective, if it was an operational decision that could have impacted on that operational activity, then uh, I would suggest no. However, does that then mean that uh, information is then shared post that point to provide support or assistance? Again, I would think it would be for the Home Office to answer that question, but um, from a policing perspective, that would be the point of engagement from a Police Scotland point of view, not under this statute, mm -hmm. but if it was a similar, uh, if there was some other activity that we were taking in terms of arrest. But Graham, I don't know if there's anything you want to add on that point. Uh, certainly, d d not to my knowledge. Um, I think as Chief Superintendent McKenzie says, it would be a matter for the Home Office. Um, we as a, a policing division do engage with groups <coughs> that support refugees and asylum seekers on a regular basis, but I certainly haven't done any engagement purely based on information that I have or didn't have in relation to any upcoming operations. And as Mr McKenzie says, that would be, a, would be an operational matter for them. And I, I, you know, it potentially could impact on it. 
I, I, I do appreciate that the, the question would have been best answered by the Home Office, and as the convener's already said, it is, um, it is, it is disappointing that they've not um, responded. But, um, and I think also you've outlined the reasons why there might be some circumstances where it wouldn't be appropriate to share uh, information, but I imagine there would also be a lot of other uh, circumstances where you would maybe have um, third sector organisations and social work departments and such like uh, working with um, uh, families in that position. And, I think that, um, you know, you know uh, can you see any advantages of such approach being, um, being widened out um, so that, you know, people can be prepared for, for what's happening? Um, again, if I may then, um, I suppose there's two components to this I would just like to say then. From a Police Scotland point of view, um, Graham, the wider Safer Communities teams across Scotland work extremely hard with partner agencies um, third sector groups to ensure that there's an element of confidence in policing, to ensure that um, we can distinguish between the activities of policing and home office immigration, um, to provide confidence in processes um, undertaken by ourselves as an organisation. But going back to the core component of your question, is there occasions when information could or should be shared with other organisations pre-immigration uh, action. I would probably relay this back to the sort of public protection um, analogy, analogy, whereby we would share information if we believed that there was a concern um, and support that was required to be provided uh, at the immediate point uh, of police activity. So I could, your argument in terms of would there be occasions when information should be shared with, for example, health and social care partnerships? I think absolutely there could be. Um, does that take place? Again, I cannot answer that question. But from a policing point of view, there are occasions when we take executive action and we do share information with partner agencies uh, and we trust partner agencies with that information because we're working collectively for the benefit of individuals and wider communities. Thank you very much. Um, Graeme? Uh, yeah, um, thank, thanks very much for the question. Uh, I think it's, it's really well put. Uh, I, I suppose the kind of like our straightforward answer is yes, we think there's a lot more that can be done in terms of maximising data sharing opportunities around what is a, a very foreseeable event, that is the use by the Home Office of its Immigration Act powers to to apprehend somebody, to detain them, and in some cases to, to be to be used in Police Scotland's custodial facilities eh, en route to a detention centre, be it in Dungavel or in another part of the UK. Um, I think when I say data sharing opportunities, we recognise you know, that, that there may be limitations on what can be shared with the third sector eh, on, on these issues, but we would certainly hope that, that there can be some information shared with the third sector, especially when there's pre-existing mandates in place, which very often there is. Eh, I would, I would suggest also in terms of the individual's rights and his relationship with, uh, for independent advice, the legal representative is going to be an absolutely pivotal person for that individual as well. Uh, and we would certainly hope to see that there's a, there's, that they're, they're centrally involved consistently always. We don't always think that is the case uh, in terms of the Home Office activities when they're undertaking immigration detention uh, powers. Uh, and. And, and as John and, and Graham were, were saying, there, there needs to be the opportunities to be involved in local statutory bodies such as the Health and Social Care Partnership. So, you know, I think one of the things that we would really like to see in the coming years in relation to this particularly vulnerable group of persons that are subject to immigration powers is that there's a multi-agency process that involves Scottish statutory and, to the extent appropriate, Scottish third sector bodies in it, eh, because that's a very important protection factor. Because one of the things I did want to mention today, and if it's eh, with the Chair's forbearance, I, I will just now, eh, and that is in terms of the Home Office are not very good at assessing vulnerability. Uh, and that's been evidenced by the fact over the last two years they've they've moved to what they call their adults at risk policy, which is to to be informing you know whether they make people uh, de put people into detention or not. Uh, the Stephen Shaw review uh, and its iteration uh, at the UK level uh, earlier on this year confirmed that you know that it really is a work in progress about how the Home Office are applying their adults at risk policy. So uh, and then an ancillary to that is that they're not. 
uh, you know, applying consistently what's known as a Rule 35 policy in the way they should be. And, it, and, and the thread that goes between them is, is, is there people that have vulnerabilities, particularly around mental health issues, that really should not be put into immigration detention in the first place? And we see far too often, and it's borne out by the evidence across the UK, is that that is the case. And that is what concerns us in relation to the Home Office making these types of life-changing, life far-reaching adverse decisions affecting individuals' liberty who really shouldn't be put into incarceration at all eh, because they haven't actually committed any, 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 any serious crimes at all, often the case. And for people in the asylum process, there is no crimes whatsoever that's been, that's been done. Eh, and, and for people to get rooted through Police Scotland facilities, and as, as John very rightly said, uh, you know, police do have primacy over the care and well-being and the health and access to rights for people at that point. And we think that there, there will be a really important opportunity for Police Scotland in the custodial facilities to be ensuring uh, that the people that the Home Office are saying have been detained actually whether they actually should be getting detained in the first place because i think that gets to the heart of one of our concerns in relation to how because we know how the home office operate in relation to issues around detention uh, it's not just me here saying that today it's backed up by by evidence over a number of years uh, and given that evidential background around that they're not good at assessing vulnerability and including in relation to the use of detention powers that's why it's really important that in scotland we maximize all the opportunities we could get to make sure that the that people who are subject to those very far-reaching powers are not uh, are, are, it's only those people that actually it's justified and it's lawful for that to be the case that the other ones are subject to it. Thank you. Uh, Chief Superintendent McKenzie, would you want to confirm, uh, presumably, or is it the same criteria that would apply to someone detained following a Home Office operation, operation as uh, their fitness to be detained? Is, that the, is it the same standard criteria? Exactly the same standard. The 21 question vulnerability assessment that we undertake for any member who comes through custody is the same assessment that we would take for Home Office immigration. Uh, and again, I go back to my earlier point. We retain primacy over the well-being of an individual who's within our custody environment. I'm glad that Graham sort of distinguished between the vulnerability assessment between one agency and another. Um, the vulnerability assessment uh, is a robust assessment process. And again, it's within the care and the custody of care and welfare manual um, and in terms of I just want to touch on the component that grims about access to uh, legal recourse um, when an individual is within our custody environment the same arrest process in SOP is, um, is used and the same police service of Scotland solicitor access guidance is used and that ultimately in simple terms means that an individual that comes through our custody environment will have the same arrest rights of accused as anybody else. They will have the right to have a solicitor informed. They will have the right to have a solicitor accessing them within the custody environment. They will have the right to have all the rights provided in a language that they understand. And they can have access to a solicitor at any time during that, uh, that period. Um, so going back to your core point, is it the same? Yes, it is. OK, thank you. That's reassuring. Rona. Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, good, good afternoon. Um, Mr O'Neill, without asking you to repeat everything you've said, I just wanted to highlight that you had suggested there was an accountability and transparency gap um, between the Home Office immigration and enforcement operations in Scotland. So is that what you said earlier, is that really what you were referring to or is there another angle to that you want to highlight? Uh, no, it, it's, it's, it's at the core and thank you for, for asking it. Uh, we think we're, a lot of a lot of our concerns are, are looking to the future to try and make sure that we protect ourselves in Scotland from some of the maybe the, the worst extremes of the hostile environment policy, uh, and and also the fact that we we fear, as I said in opening remarks, that there'll be more people with insecure immigration status who are in who are currently EU citizens who will actually be subject to immigration enforcement activities who have not been in the past. Uh, so that being the case, we often think about, well, what are the safeguards we can put in place in Scotland in relation to that? And one of the obvious places we went to is our various inspectorates in Scotland who know the prisons, who know the police service, and who know 
uh, the application of the prosecution code by fiscals better than anyone else does. Uh, so that's why we think that this is something that we would really invite the committee to, to consider is about having looked at the legislation for each of the, the, the Scottish inspectorates in the three areas that I mentioned. Uh, we can't see a barrier that's named within that legislation to those activities get, getting undertaken. Um, and that being the case, we think that there is definitely potential for, for example, a, a thematic inspection, maybe a joint thematic inspection that looks a, across the three, by the three Scottish inspectorates looking at the issue of how are people with insecure immigration status treated within by, by the criminal justice organisations in Scotland. And then, but that is very much in relation to uh, the Home Office immigration compliance activities uh, for, for those individuals. So there's a number of foreign national offenders in, in, in Scottish prisons, not high numbers, but there are there. And we know of cases where people uh, who have served a sentence in a Scottish prison are then moved to a remand unit within that Scottish prison. Uh, and you know, in some cases, it's people who have committed serious criminal offences and, and are liable to deportation, but that doesn't happen. And then people are still in that Scottish prison, they're in a limbo period, and there's a lot of public funds getting used there, and the Home Office aren't supporting Scottish bodies. And that's not a sustainable arrangement to have, especially if you've got a number of people. But then we also know of people um, who are foreign national offenders who should actually, who have served a sentence and then are moved straight into immigration detention facilities and then are left in immigration detention facilities as well. Um, and I suppose what I'm trying to get at here is there's a really invisible, vulnerable population here uh, that we really don't properly understand, you know, in Scotland. We don't really understand what are their rights in terms of how they are feeling, their rights to legal advice, their rights to health care, etc. Um, and it's just a kind of a symptom, I suppose, of the deeper issue, which is how much our inspection, inspection, inspection community, our regulatory community around these areas, understanding what it means to have insecure immigration status in Scotland, and how, and obviously one part of that is foreign national offenders, there's a much wider group of people who have insecure immigration status, who at some point will be subject to immigration activities, uh, and that will rub up against uh, Scottish criminal justice agencies in it's, it, it, it's some cases. So it's just to try and get a regulatory community to think about how they can build this particular vulnerability that stems from insecure immigration status into their work, their mainstream regulatory work. Thank you. That's that's helpful. Just very briefly, um, Superintendent, you, you said in your op in the opening um, answer to, to convener's questions about the form that you fill in. You know, the the, the initial form for risk assessment, etc. Who takes the final decision on that? Who makes the decision on the risk assessment? Home office. Oh, so it's the home office. Yeah. So you, you do your bit, and the home office take the right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, supplementary, Mr. Stewart, and then. Um, I really want a very brief answer to this because I don't want to go down this rabbit hole too far. Um, do we have access to enough interpreters of the right language skills for people who, for whom English may be very far from being their first language? So the, the, the very brief answer to that is my assessment is yes. Uh, Police Scotland have just uh, signed off a new contract uh, which uh, deals with both face-to-face -face and telephone interpreting services. Um, obviously, that is continually monitored, and that falls under my remit. Um, so the feedback that I have is yes, with the caveat that it's continually monitored. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Okay. If I could return to the gap issue, and um, I, I think, Mr Neil, in your submission, you, you say that this can leave um, a reduction in public confidence in criminal justice institu institutions in Scotland and a, a misperception. I noted in your opening remarks you referred uh, specifically to the need for criminal sanctions for those um, who let out properties. Now, this is, is quite a... Uh, it's an issue that's gone on for years and years. I can remember as convener of the Equalities, um, uh, Equalities Committee, then there were multiple people being let, uh, were, were being given lets in, in multiple occupancy, promised in dreadful conditions, and these rogue lying lords never really seemed to 
to be picked up. Uh, is that still the case, that that is continuing and our laws here maybe, and that's not necessarily for the, the, the police, it's maybe we don't have the sections. I'll be in, interested to hear um, just where the, the uh, responsibility lies. Uh, well. In, in my opening remarks, uh, thank you for the question, uh, I, was, I was referring to the criminal sanction regime which is created in the Immigration Act 2016 mm -hmm. from the Westminster Parliament, which uh, made it a criminal, uh, made, made it a, created criminal sanctions for individuals, often private landlords, who uh, let out accommodation to people, entered a residential tenancy agreement with people mm -hmm. who actually didn't have the, the, the requisite leave to remain to enter such an agreement. And then and, and there, there needed to be a, a, a kind of, from a reasonable grounds perspective, uh, for a criminal sanction to be applied, some degree of knowledge of the person mm -hmm. uh, who was letting out the landlord, who was letting out the property, that, that, that there was maybe something not completely correct about somebody's immigration status. And I was making using that, that's not enforced in Scotland, that regime, that criminal sanction mm -hmm. regime, uh, from our perspective, thankfully so. Um, it is in, it is in existence in, in England at the moment. And I use that more as an example to, to illustrate the, 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 I suppose often people talk about the crimin, crimin Negation. It's like you know you can combine criminal and immigration law together, mm -hmm. um, and and how that can have quite an invidious effect on individuals uh, who are subject to that law, but also uh, it can have quite a, an, an invidious effect also on people who are who are expected, such as landlords, to act in as de facto immigration officers when really they are landlords at the end of the day and they're just trying to do their job about letting out lawfully their property. Uh, and it's, it's supposed that I was using that just as an example to illustrate the deeper point that there is this is an increasingly complex area of law um, and immigration law, and it has within it a, a real growth in criminal sanctions, and that creates quite significant effects on individuals that are subject to it. Uh, and the people that we work with uh, in the refugee protection spectrum have, to an extent, been at the sharp end of some of the hostile environment measures over the last 15 years, and we fear that there's going to be a much greater number of people as a result of EU withdrawal. And it's not a political point, it's more about the statement of immigration facts that if a person's current immigration status is secure, EU withdrawal will mean that it's not automatically secure again. And that means that people will then have to satisfy settled status. And if they can't satisfy the, the, the UK government's settled status regime, then what may happen is that they are subject to a, <coughs> they, they fall into insecure immigration status and then can be falling into immigration enforcement activities. So that we think, we fear, could particularly affect individuals who are from the north of Central Europe to the south of Central Europe in Scotland. People who are concentrated in particular sectors where there is maybe less labour market regulation, lower pay, etc., and who will not be able to satisfy as, as easily the, the settled status. So I, I, we're trying to look not too far to the future to say we have a problem here. Uh, we have a, a, a growth in the number of people who are going to have insecure immigration status in Scotland, a growth in the people that will not be able to satisfy the settled status regime, and therefore it will be the Home Office through their immigration enforcement activities, sorry, that will be taking yeah. those, those. I understand. I think you're right to highlight in, in advance of us um, not really knowing why, where Brexit is going. Uh, and I do take your point about landlords not having to, to police. That's not their job to police. But equally, the question I asked you originally was, I think, a very pertinent one, a very vexing one, where you get rogue landlords taking dreadful um, advantage of people who are vulnerable, who are unsure, unsure of their, their status and are living in dreadful conditions. Has that improved? And if it hasn't, how do we address that, given that a lot of what we're, we're looking at, and I know you call for a wider inquiry into relationships between the Scottish uh, Criminal Justice in, and the Home Office, and so much of this is reserved, it seems to me that this particular aspect is devolved and something that we actually can do, um, do something about here and now. People who have insecure immigration status uh, have 
uh, are extremely vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's precisely that insecure immigration status that makes them vulnerable. Um, and that can be and is used as a control method at one extreme end of the spectrum by traffickers and, and, and organised criminals to control people's uh, movements, to control people what they do, and to control the conditions upon which they live. Uh, in a previous life, I was involved uh, in work around human trafficking in, in Scotland, and, and, and we worked very closely with the police, police in relation to that, and we continue to do so at Scottish Refugee Council. Also, um, you know, we, we, we continually make the point but about... But on the rogue landlord yeah. point specifically, so, we know it's rife. So, so on, on you know, if, if we have landlords who are not upholding standards, you know, and, and you know, referred to as, as rogue landlords, uh, you know, that's that's something that, that needs to be subject to the various, various, uh, you know, powers that are available. So one obvious one would be for local authorities to be to be able to, to, to be making sure that those, that the people are who are acting in those ways shouldn't be acting in those ways and obviously there could be a role particularly it gets to the extreme end of the spectrum for Police Scotland to be involved in terms of indicators of trafficking and exploitation uh, and it gets back to, to, to Mr McGregor's point earlier on around you know in a different context about how we need to in Scotland we think take control as much as we possibly can through our statutory bodies working together and bringing the Home Office Immigration Enforcement round the table into multi-agency decision-making, uh, shared decision-making around that. can I stop you there? That, that particular um, aspect is devolved, involves the immigrants, is something we can do something about now. Perhaps, please, Scotland, have you come across this um, to, to any large extent? Uh, have, is it something that you're dealing with quite frequently? Um, Graham, I don't know if you want to make mention from a Glasgow point of view. Um, <clears throat> I'm aware it, it does exist. I'm, I'm not aware of any specific instances, to my knowledge. Mm. That doesn't mean it hasn't happened. It yeah. just doesn't sit within my area of business. Um, the, the engagement I have is, is directly with um, asylum seekers, refugees and, and groups that, that assist those people. But I do hear anecdotally um, of, of that kind of thing. Yeah, because it's, it's these precise people yeah. that are sometimes brought over here on false pretenses, and then when they get here, you know, the accommodation, etc., it's, it's, it's really inhumane. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that's something we'd all welcome a review of. I think an impact assessment, if I understood you properly, Chief Superintendent, um, community impact assessments, you you do carry these out and, and, or, and then assess at the end of a, a process whether you think there has been a an impact on the community and then you take that. Is that what I understood you in one of the six strands to say? Well, I suppose a community impact assessment is probably seen as a bit of a living document and as much as you try and make a determination of the impact that an action prior to taking place will have on the community, you monitor whether that action has had an impact on the community yeah. and then you will consider the, the post event. Um, so it is a bit of a living document that goes from the pre to the post activity, if that, if mm -hmm. that answers the question that you're asking. Yeah, I think and, and if I may, um, just on your earlier point, and I'll, I'll keep this very brief, the very subject matter that you raised was raised by um, MSP Christina McKelvey at the Quality and Human Rights Committee last year. Mm -hmm. There was a response provided by Police Scotland on that very subject in terms of not the issue specifically about landlords, but just that issue about when there's vulnerable people, no matter where they're from, people will take. Um, will exploit that vulnerability, mm -hmm. uh, including uh, issues such as uh, you've highlighted in terms of um, whether, it's, whether it's within a landlord basis or, but it just highlights uh, some evidence in relation to the exploitation of individuals from vulnerable backgrounds, mm -hmm. including um, asylum seeking uh, well, communities. It's five years since I've been the convener of the Equal Opportunities Committee and it was a big issue then. Yeah. So it's maybe something we need to look into more. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Liam? Yeah, good afternoon. Um, Chief Superintendent McKenzie, earlier on I think you were offering some reassurances around the assessment made on, on, on vulnerability. You've also, I think, in your written evidence provided figures suggesting um, for the 2017-2018 uh, uh, there were something like 500, over 530 um, people detained in police cells, police custody. I was just wondering whether you could um, describe the, the impact that those sort of numbers uh, have on police cu custody in general. I think the, 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 the significant majority were over a period of 24 hours, but there were a number that, um, that, that, that exceeded uh, 48 hours. So it would be helpful to understand 
sort of the time frames we're talking about, the impact on the on the on the um, the custody suites, and indeed whether you believe that's an appropriate setting uh, for those individuals uh, um, in any event. So you're referencing uh, information that's came from a Freedom of Information mm -hmm. Act request and then was put publicly uh, into the media in August 2018, right. which references the numbers, and I think you're absolutely right, it says 537 individuals within custody, and it breaks down the, the stations uh, across uh, and up to individuals who were detained up to 24 hours. So that could be an hour to 24 hours. 384, 25 to 48 is 126 persons, and over 48 hours is 27. Um, in terms of the numbers, do I, ha do I believe that that has a significant impact on uh, custody division? Any additional numbers will have an impact, of course they will. Um, Home Office Immigration have a financial liability towards to Police Scotland to provide in relation to uh, using our facilities. So the longer somebody is within our facilities, the, the, the larger that financial liability is. Um, and so, but when you see the breakdown in terms of the, um, the, the breakdown across Scotland, impact, yes. Significant impact, my assessment is no. Um, in terms of the second component to your question, is um, do I think it's an appropriate facility for individuals to be retained within? Um, HMICS back in 2014 raised concerns about the, the amount of time um, and there was a process put in place to ensure that individuals are kept in with the minimal amount of time as at all possible. Um, the, the outlier seems to be the 48 hours, 27 individuals. There is a robust uh, process in place using the Force Custody Manager, which I will not go into within this uh, environment because it will take up a bit of time. But again, I will provide that in writing if that pleases the committee. Um, what I would say is a custody facility within a police environment is a temporary facility to retain somebody safely for the, the process of justice to take place. Ideally, the, the, uh, the, the ideal position is somebody is in and out as quickly as possible. Um, the, ra the reasons for individuals being kept for 48 hours may be, uh, there may be a multitude of reasons for that in terms of logistics, distance of travel and so on. But my position is that a custody facility within police should be kept to the minimum in terms of time frame. Graham previously was a custody sergeant so uh, many moons ago, so I don't know if Graham has a, a view uh, different from that. I would entirely agree with Mr McKenzie. Um, I suppose you could say it's the, the responsibility of the custody sergeant to ensure that the criteria that Mr McKenzie has outlined are adhered to. Um, and certainly in, in my experience, albeit it was a number of years ago, um, you know, I would be quite robust and say that, you know, this person will be here for the minimum amount of time that is required. And um, I would just make sure that um, I kept on top of things, put it that way, uh, in terms of that person. Um, and if I could just, sorry, if I just could stress a point here. Um, any police officer who came into this committee and asked, are custody division robust in their decision making in relation to keeping people in custody? The answer is absolutely yes, professional, robust. And that is why I'm confident that actually the first custody officer does all that they possibly can to ensure that that state is as minimal as possible. And that will include escalating it up. Um, there is a review process uh, uh, throughout a 24 hour period, continuously reviewed. Um, but any police officer would have the same position that Graham. Robustness is key in terms of keeping people in custody. That, that's helpful. I'll be interested in Mr O'Neill's uh, views on this in, in, in a second, but it, just touching on the, the point you made about the HMICS um, report in 2014, obviously they flagged up um, concerns. They emphasised the need to, to minimise the, 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 the time that um, uh, people were being detained in this way. The figures under the FY request only relate to um, 27, 2018, I think there was a suggestion that figures before that would be um, too, uh, too costly to, to, to compile. But since 2014, what is your impression of um, the, the, the trends in terms of the numbers being detained and indeed for the, the duration of time that they are they're being detained in, in police custody? Okay, my, my assessment is that in terms of the, the times 
there. Uh, decreasing. I, like you, do not have the figures in front of me for the previous years to make a specific determination on that. I, again, tried to obtain that information before coming here because I sense that that would be a question that was raised. Um, my assessment is the time is decreasing. However, what I can categorically state is, since HMICS uh, made that recommendation in 2014, the process in terms of monitoring, escalation uh, and reviewing is is a robust process, and that in itself gives me confidence that the minimum amount of time possible is used for people in police custody. Uh, in terms of actual figures, again, I, I think if the, the challenge existed with the FI, FY to provide those figures, I think I would be challenged as well to get those figures. I, for, and I appreciate that, that I, in fact, I'd be highly um, suspicious if yeah. you were able to produce the figures that yeah. hadn't been produced under, under FOI. That would open up a, mm -hmm. a whole new line of inquiry. But, um, it, 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 it's interesting that the, the, the comments you make in relation to the trend. In terms of specific um, categories of, of, of detainees, where there is a family involved, what would be the assessment made of um, the appropriateness of detention in, in custody, where there, there are children involved? What would be the, the, the process that the custody sergeant would go through in, in those circumstances? <coughs> okay, so the issue of children in custody, I think, as a country, and when you look back at Colbrandon in the 60s, in terms of we do not criminalise children, we do not keep children in custody. Cust children will not be kept in custody. Um, you know, that is the position that Police Scotland has, has taken. Um, you know, so... That but in I terms of the parents of... of, 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 of I mean, those who, who have children who would be affected by the parent being detained in custody, what what is the... the How is that assessment made by... Police Scotland by custody sergeants. Um, I mean, presumably it would be seen as a material factor in, in, in whether or not it would be appropriate. I mean, would it be a material factor in terms of, you know, is it lawful to detain that person in custody? Um, you know, <clears throat> the factor would be, con however, I go back to the point of primacy here. Primacy sits with Home Office Immigration. We are presented with an individual in custody and a determination is made on the basis of the assessment of risk and vulnerability to that individual, the assessment of whether it's lawful to retain that individual, um, the wider factors in terms of impact to an individual's family. Um, would it be a factor? I would like to hope it's a factor for Home Office Immigration to make a determination of how they deal with an individual. That's, mm. that's what... But in terms of the cold process of a custody environment to facilitate the process to determine what happens to an individual. Uh, I am not, I suppose the answer is, would it be a factor? Not a great factor, I don't suppose, but again, I, I, Graham, unless Graham wants to make any wider comment from a custody sergeant's perspective, but Home Office Immigration Enforcement would have to take that these points into consideration, as Police Scotland would have to take these points into consideration if we were arresting a parent of a child for another criminal or statutory act. So you're saying that the assessment would essentially be made by Home Office and yeah. Immigration rather than Police Scotland. Mr O'Neill, do you have any observations, both in terms of what's happening as a as a trend, but but, but also in relation to the specific point about um, individuals, particularly those with family? Yeah, uh, well, thank you for the question. Uh, I think it's very pertinent uh, for, for the following reasons. Firstly, in terms of uh, whether there's a trend, I think the honest answer is we, none of us in this room know um, we don't know if it's a trend because there isn't proactive public monitoring of <clears throat> of this data. And I know that sounds like a criticism. It's not a loose criticism. It's more <clears throat> an example of here we have people who are detained under Immigration Act powers that are in transit getting put into Police Scotland custodial facilities. As John and Graham rightly say, Police Scotland in that, in that window have primacy over the health and well-being and what we think follows from that is that we need to have a clearer um, set of standards almost kind of plus the standard operating procedure that we have for this particular situation which recognises distinctive vulnerabilities of people with insecure immigration status so there is high levels or, or higher levels of of trauma often within this population there is the, the fact that they do need, because of the insecure immigration status, access to immigration law advice as well. And as was touched on earlier, they do need to have 
an interpreter so that they can understand everything that's happening around them. Remember, this is a particularly stressful point in their lives. So we think this is where you really do need to have your standard operating procedure plus something that recognises the distinctive vulnerabilities that come from the fact that you have insecure immigration status in the way that I've just described. So we need to have like proactive, regular monitoring of this that goes underneath numbers and gets into some of the stuff that you rightly say we're asking around, you know, the, the demographics, then you know, and the profile within people who are subject to this. I go back to what I was saying earlier, the Home Office in our view, and we can see it, you know, through evidence are not good at assessing vulnerability. So we are very sceptical of Home Office immigration detention decisions. And therefore, we see actually Police Scotland's involvement in this as a real opportunity in a Scottish context to make sure that the Home Office are actually getting vulnerability right and are not detaining people uh, that they should not be detaining because we know that that happens. Uh, I can think of a case that, 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 that earlier on this year where an individual... Uh, had significant learning difficulties, had a mental age of a child, but was detained uh, in Police Scotland facilities. Now, that shouldn't have happened. And the reason that happened, we think, is because the way things often happen, the Home Office make a decision around immigration detention, they're looking for somewhere to put somebody en route to a detention centre, either in Dungavo or somewhere else in the UK, and then the... the uh, the, the actual needs of that individual and that critical, consistent questioning about should this person or persons be in detention in the first place? And we think often the answer will be no, they shouldn't be in detention in the first but, place. Sorry, just to, sorry to interrupt you there, but, but Chief Superintendent, uh, Superintendent McKenzie described earlier on the, the I think, 21 um, phase assessment of, of vulnerability. I mean, the, in, the, in the example that you've just cited, it would suggest that 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 assessment hasn't worked. I mean, irrespective of whether the original um, uh, failures in the assessment process uh, were those of Home Office Im Immigration, um, there was then a subsequent failure, presumably, of, of Police Scotland's sort of triaging an assessment of, of vulnerability if it hadn't picked up um, uh, the, the, the concerns that you've identified. On this point, it's like, and this is, I think it's, it's important to be really honest and straightforward here. You know, nobody's going to get everything perfect all of the time, you know, uh, we completely recognise that Police Scotland are, are, are working at the front line with people who are in extremely stressful situations, situations that maybe in some cases we can't even imagine. Uh, so we, we, we completely recognise that. But what we're saying is, is we can do better in relation to multi-agency approach in Scotland in relation to certain activities that the Home Office undertake, one of which we're spending a bit of time, I think, very helpfully on, which is around the use of police custodial facilities for, for people who have been detained under Immigration Act powers. Uh, and that's why we suggest one of the recommendations that the, the committee may want to consider here is looking at some of the key standard operating procedures that Police Scotland have and thinking, OK, what are the ones that we can maybe add the insecure immigration status dimension to, recognising the distinctive vulnerabilities that exist for people in that situation. Uh, so, yeah, so we know it's not always going to work all the time, but we think that we really don't know if everybody was honest about what's actually happening in terms of is legal representation getting given every time, is mental health assessments and the vulnerability indicators getting done every time. You know, we're not confident in the Home Office do that. Uh, so, you know, and that means we're not confident in the information the Home Office are passing to Police Scotland. And because of that, we suggest that it's important to be very sceptical often of the information the Home Office pass on these issues to, in this case, Police Scotland. Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, we're very much partners with Police Scotland in relation to a whole range of work and community engagement, etc., and very much so in relation to this issue as well. Mm. I was going to... I'm conscious that I've, There's I've a supplementary, I think, on one of your points from Fine. Liam and uh, from Fulton, and then you come back yeah. in, Liam. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm also conscious of time, so I'll, I'll make it quite brief. But um, does the, the panel think that Liam MacArthur uh, previously in a question in there around a uh, hypothetical situation where uh, people with uh, caring responsibilities are going to be detained? Does that go back then to my earlier question about uh, a need for? Um, there'll be a bit more joint up working and I know it's the responsibility of the Home Office but I think this is 
this is pretty crucial, and because if you can let statutory organisations and third sector organisations know something's happened, even if it's on a confidential basis, um, they could start preparing um, for situations like that. And I just have a very brief response if that's possible. So it does go back to your original point, where there is a legal framework to share that information, where there is a purpose for sharing that information, um, under the example that's been provided in terms of child welfare, child concerns, you know, if you're moving from a parent and then you've got the wider care responsibility, of course, there'd be an expectation to have that discussion. Uh, and that would be a police calling position if we were undertaking an operation. And so, about, and I, I suppose just two minor points, just conscious of the time. The, the case that's been referred to by Graham O'Neill, I've got no knowledge of that. I'm more than happy to go away and have a look at that case. It's uh, not came across my radar in my research. And the last point I would say about, actually, if you, the, the Police Scotland SOP Section 12A actually references um, individuals who are arrested from an immigration perspective eh, or from, um, in relation to immigration or wider um, statutory um, offences. So that aspect of it's embedded in that SOP about the expectation rights of individuals who come through our doors under you know, immigration legislation, um, and it's actually embedded within that SOP under 12A. Yes, sorry, thanks, uh, Convener. I, um, I was just going to return to the issue of the Home Office policy um, presumption is against is in favour of temporary admission or release rather than detention. I was just interested to know what level of discretion there is for Police Scotland to, to make uh, the determination on on uh, an alternative to detention and uh, whether or not there's anything you can say about um, the, the provisions that would be put in place in, in, in those circumstances, whether electronic monitoring is involved, whether there's, there, there are um, bail provisions applied. Um, Again, I, I go back to what, uh, some of my points at the original point. Home Office immigration have primacy. We have a window of, uh, in, in terms of our responsibility for that individual. Uh, in terms of our input, in terms of the terms of liberation, actually, that's for Home Office immigration enforcement to uh, deal with and answer. So any, any, any decisions around release would effectively be Home Office decisions rather than Police Scotland? Um, in terms of the conditions in which they are released under, whether they are released um, uh, with leave to stay or whether they are uh, retained and then moved to a detention centre, then actually, again, that's a Home Office immigration enforcement decision. Mr O'Neill? Yeah, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a really, again, a really pertinent point. The, the Home Office are actively looking, which we welcome, at pilots around alternatives to detention. Uh, you know, that's been partly because there's been so much criticism of detention, rightly, as, as part of the immigration system in the way that it has been. Um, it's a very costly uh, thing for the Home Office to be doing. Uh, and, in, 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 and as we know, that many people are held in detention for periods of time and then subsequently released. And, you know, and there was never actually through that release, there was never actually a purpose for them being there in the first place. So that's all kind of acknowledged and recognised in the UK. And, and, and thankfully, the Home Office seem now to be saying, OK, we need to think about community-based alternatives to detention. So the pilot in, uh, in relation to Yarrowswood right now, there's a start in a pilot in relation to women who would have been put into Yarrowswood uh, Detention Centre uh, and they're working with an organisation in Newcastle and the, the, there's been some public information the Immigration Minister shared with the Joint Committee on Human Rights at Westminster today actually about, about precisely that. And that's getting done in conjunction with UNHCR and um, through its UK representative. Uh, we actually think in Scotland there is something valuable about alternatives to detention being piloted here also. Uh, and we would very much encourage Police Scotland potentially as a, as a partner in relation to that, particularly given you know, that we know that Police Scotland have uh, you know, police custodial facilities being used by the Home Office. And we, we, we think that Police Scotland you know, definitely have those opportunities, as John rightly said. Uh, and, and, and we think probably a mindset as well to try and like criti cri have a sceptical, critical attitude to the quality of the Home Office assessment that has led to the original decision to detain in the first place. So there's something there around a Scottish partnership 
that could be formed in relation to an alternative detentions pilot. And that's something that you know that we would very much encourage. And in terms of that, you talked about it being a, a costly option, but presumably it, that needs to be weighed up against the, the, the costs of the, the current um, approach taken. I mean, have you got any sense as to whether or not we're talking about additional cost or whether uh, actually over time you're talking about a reduced cost as opposed to the detention approach? It, I think the I, I've not got the exact figures, but I'm very confident to say the detention approach is unbelievably more expensive than a community based approach. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, you want yes, to yes, I have just briefly asked you, I'm conscious of time, um, if you could, um, Chief Superintendent and Sergeant, tell us what work's been done to engage with um, migrant and ethnic communities just to develop their understanding of how you protect them, etc., and engage with them. I'll come to Graham, please. Thank you. <coughs> um, I work in the, the Safer Community. Safer Communities Department in Greater Glasgow Police Division, and our remit is to do exactly as you said, um, engage with um, asylum seekers, refugees, and also the, the groups and organisations that support them. So the, the main focus of our work is to, to break down the barriers between Police Scotland and such people and organisations, and to hopefully build trust um, with people. Um, we're conscious of, of, of maybe attitudes towards um, authority figures based on experiences um, from, of, from countries of, of, of origin. So um, what we do is we engage with our, you know, probably all of the, the, the organisations that are there in Glasgow um, to represent and, and work with asylum seekers and refugees. Um, and I can give you a couple of maybe specific examples of that. that well, would just be, in general, how practically does that work then? Do you organise meetings or do you... Yeah, yeah. so what we do is we, we, we attend maybe events that they, they've organised and we go along. Um, we go to meetings that um, that maybe groups that have been set up to committees and such like. My my experience is that, that asylum seekers, refugees, and groups want you to go and support them. They want you to go and listen to them. They want you to understand their experiences. And I think for me as a police officer, that's really important because that informs the work that I then do thereafter. Uh, and part of my job is to then cascade that to other officers um, so that they hopefully have a, a better understanding of the situation that these people find themselves in and, and the experiences that they've gone through before they come here, uh, which I think is important. Thank you. Just one other quick question. You, you indicate that the number of um, employment applications from ethnic minority communities has increased. Can you maybe say how this has been translated into the police numbers and give us any indication of figures? Um, so I, I think you're referencing the positive action uh, reference within the, the submission. Um, Two months ago, I think I sat in this room and I talked about the sort of positive action approach and the very important component of ensuring that Police Scotland have a representative workforce which represent the communities we serve. Um, and we have been working tremendously hard to try and achieve that. We are at, at last year I highlighted, actually we're talking about a 10 year journey, probably 10 year plus journey, but over the last year, um, I've referenced that uh, new recruits coming through Tully Allen, um, about, I think it's 9.4% if I recall, if my memory serves me right from our submission, uh, just under 10% of new recruits coming through Tully Allen are from BME communities. Um, however, that's just the start of this journey. It's not just the recruitment component, it's the retention component is significantly important the advancement within the organisation, the lateral development in the organisation. So actually we have representation at every rank, we have representation in every department within Police Scotland and throughout uh, the, 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 the organisation in total. As I say, it's a 10 year journey at least, mm -hmm. but actually we're beginning to get there. Is it moving as fast as you would have, you would have liked? You know, you... I think it is, and as much as I recognise that there is not an easy solution to this, and actually this is about the, the work that Graham and the team do about building confidence within communities, about engaging, uh, ensuring that the police service is seen as a career that individuals from BME communities want to pursue. Um, so I accept actually the aim of this is never to have a very quick burst. This is a sustained approach over 10 years to ensure that actually we get the candidates in and we can keep uh, and we retain candidates. Okay. And actually, um, it's a really interesting when um, 
when you speak to officers across uh, Scotland now from BME communities, they have a, ne a network, they have formed their own network, um, very positive towards organisation. I think in 10 years' time, we will come back here and we will provide a success story of Police Scotland, which will be the envy of policing across the UK. OK, thank you. Thank you. That, that's certainly very positive news, uh, Chief Superintendent. Um, uh, you're going to provide us with some information. I wonder, could you look at, given that you referred previously, Chief Superintendent, to a charging regime that will exist so that the Home Office are billed effectively for the use of the facilities, and what information could be gleaned about that? Maybe numbers and duration, for instance. If, if you could look and see if you could provide any information on that. We're, we're, we're going, due to finish at, at 10 past, I wonder, Mr O'Neill, it was yourself that raised these concerns. Yep. Is there a final brief comment? We've, we found the evidence helpful. We'll discuss that at the conclusion of our meeting, but a yep. final brief comment? Yeah, well, just to continue the, the theme of, you know, we really welcome and, and, you know, we've worked very closely with Police Scotland, especially in Glasgow. You know, they really do take, you know, building a uh, confidence with community seriously. I work a lot with Graham uh, on an operational basis uh, and they're incredibly helpful. Uh, and that's part of our motivation for raising this issue, as we said in a written submission, is that, you know, we really don't want to see all that hard earned work, which takes years to get undermined through misperceptions around Home Office activities actually being misperceived as Police Scotland activities. Uh, and and be, we think that is absolutely critical uh, in terms of maintaining and safeguarding Police Scotland's uh, fundamental, which is to have community confidence, because if it doesn't have community confidence, especially from communities that are vulnerable, uh, then you know it's not going to get the information, it's not going to get the intelligence, it's not going to be able to do the job that it's there to do, which is to protect people. Uh, and we're looking at, as I said at the start, in part around you know a much wider group of people with insecure immigration status, who therefore will be at risk of destitution, who will therefore be at risk of you know, potentially home office immigration enforcement activities. And if I was doing a risk assessment in this in relation to Police Scotland and other criminal justice bodies, I would be seeing those risks and I'd be thinking, OK, what is the impact that's going to have on us in terms of our core business, which is protecting the public and that being based upon having community confidence. So I think that's why we think it's a really serious issue and we're trying to forward look in, in that regard. And, and we're really grateful for the committee to taking the time. OK, thank you, uh, Mr O'Neill. Thank you, Chief Superintendent Mackenzie, Sergeant Sterling. That's been very helpful, both your written evidence, what we've heard today, and the further information that you're going to provide us with, Chief Superintendent. So uh, that now concludes the public session of the meeting. Thank you very much.